Hey, what's going on? It's Joey Myers from the Hitting Performance Lab, and in the softball hitting drills fast pitch for timing video, we're going to answer the reader questions of why is timing not taught by a majority of instructors? And what I find is some of my friends that I do respect their hitting knowledge do, do not feel that you can teach timing. Great mechanics are no good without being on time. Also, how to teach timing. We're going to go over a couple different things. We're going to go over my bad hitting outcomes checklist. We're going to talk about the art of variance in the beanbag study. And then we're going to wrap up with the varied reaction live toss drill. So let's first start with why is timing not taught? Now it's something that in the past we, didn't, we really didn't know much about how to really teach timing except for cueing on certain pitchers on the pitcher's delivery. So time your swing, start your swing when the pitcher breaks their hands or whatnot. But for me, timing is a feel. And we can teach timing, in which you'll find out in the drill that we're going we're gonna to round up this video with at the end. But what I wanted to do is I wanted to give you the bad hitting outcomes checklist because what happens is, and this was my fault when I was making the transition when I was younger from Little League, 12 years old, into the, onto the big field because we didn't have any pony rules or anything like that. We just went straight 45, 46 foot mounds to 60 foot mounds. So I was 15 feet that made a huge difference in reaction time and it was actually, I was way out in front. I ended up messing with my mechanics. I had a really good, my, uh, my 12 year old year was really, really good in Little League. I was out in front when I made the switch and I couldn't figure out what it was so I went to Barnes and Noble and read as many books on hitting as I could, any mechanics, and ended up screwing myself up for about four years. And even after that, my, about my junior year in high school, even after that my power didn't come back. So if I could go back in time, I would basically teach the drill that we're going to talk about in this video and it would have fixed me right away. I would hit the ground running at the new distance and it wouldn't even been a forethought. But my bad hitting outcomes checklist, we talk about this after every five swing round. You can do three to five swing rounds and I totally recommend it because in the games you're getting a pitch. Hitters are seeing a pitch if it's fast pitch softball between 10 and 15 seconds between pitches. Baseball might be between 10 and 10 and 20 seconds between pitches. So rapid fire soft toss really doesn't make, make any sense. But we want to train, we want to practice like we're going to play so we play like we practice. So what we do is a five swing round in the cage. After those five swings, we do an evaluation. Basically the first question I ask them on the checklist is, are we swinging at strikes? Yes or no? Second question on the checklist is, are we on time? Yes or no? And you know, how many of the swings were we on time? How many of the swings that we took out of those five swings did we swing at strikes? And then lastly, and this is in order of priority, priority one being are we swinging at strikes, priority two being on time. The last priority are mechanics. If we're still not getting or if we're still getting bad outcomes hitting wise and we are swinging at strikes, we're on time, then the most likely culprit is mechanics. Because here's the deal, if you're not swinging at strikes, if a hitter's not swinging at strikes, their mechanics will melt down. If they're swinging at balls that are almost shining their shoes, if they're swinging at balls that are over their head, it's not, when they're swinging at a pitch like this, it's not going to look like any kind of hitter. You put Albert Pujol slow motion swing on YouTube, it's not going to look like that because they're not swinging at strikes. Now granted, in, in Little League, we, got, we don't have the best umpires because they're just getting going, they're practicing, whatever. So we're seeing a lot of balls for a righty, maybe three balls outside being called strikes. Okay, we have to figure out how to make an adjustment and get to those balls, but umpires are not, in Little League are not going to be calling the ball way out here. It might look like that to you, but it's not, it's not that far outside. Okay? They're not calling strikes way up here. Every once in a while it might be rarity, but not, not a high percentage of the time. Yes, you might see some pitches that are out here more consistently called strikes, but our kids swinging at balls out here, up here, and down here, and even, even maybe two inside if they're off the plate. They don't need to be swinging at balls. Okay, you get three strikes, you get three swings each each at bat if you get that far. So we want to make sure they're swinging at strikes, or else their me their mechanics are going to melt down. The second question being on time. If they're swinging at strikes, but they're not on time, just like our reader talked about, that great mechanics are no good without being on time. A hitter could could be swinging at a strike. It's coming in. It's going to hit the catcher's glove over the over the strike zone, over the plate. But if they're out in front, they're going to be having their mechanics are going to be melting down. If they're late, their mechanics are going to melt down. Especially on late, your body actually will cut fat. So instead of landing bent, if we're with our front leg, front leg at landing, if we're late, if our if our brain senses we're going to be late, a lot of times we'll land straight. 
which is no good because we have no adaptability in our swing and we have no way to be able to push into the ground and change planes of motion into our twisty motion which is for another video so we want to make sure that they're on time or else mechanics melt down now for only for practice only we do not talk about mechanics in games. In games, it's all about competing. Competing, it's all about are you swinging at strikes? Are you on time? Basically, those two things is all we talk about in games. For practice, we add the mechanics element because we're actually trying to fine tune. We're trying to sharpen the sword. So if we get a bad outcome, we're swinging at strikes. We're on time. Then we talk about mechanics. Okay, the effective mechanics that we're learning. Are we doing those things? Are we working on finger pressure, bottom three fingers of the top hand only? Were you doing that all the way through impact? Were you landing and getting shorter with the front knee? Were you getting shorter with the back or staying shorter with the back knee? Those are things we talk about in practice. And if we're still getting bad outcomes, say we're hitting the ball on the ground all the time, okay, but we're swinging the strikes and we're on time, most likely it's that back knee angle that's the issue. So we're probably stiffening it up, that back leg, and which is causing us hitting the ground or low level line drive. So we want to get lift on the ball. We have to have a good bend in that back knee. So that's the bad hitting outcomes checklist. Now the art of variance, there was a there was a study, a great study that was the beanbag, I call it the beanbag toss study. So they had a a group of grade schoolers, they, had, they split them into two groups, A and B. They had group A practice throwing beanbags in a bucket that was three feet away. Group B practiced throwing beanbags in two buckets. One was two feet, one was four feet away. They did, both of these two groups practiced for 15 minutes and then they called them to, to all of them, all of them test and see how well they could throw into the bucket that was three feet away. Which group do you think did better? A, who was practicing on the three foot or B, who was practicing on two and four? Well, if you thought A, you got tricked, and that's what happened to me. It was group B that did better. How come? Because they had two points of reference, two frames of reference to choose from. See, they were practicing on the shorter, throwing it too short, and throwing it too long in relation to that three-foot bucket. So when they got on the three-foot bucket, they had two frames of reference. Oh, I just throw it right in the middle. Whereas a three-foot bucket, people just had one frame of reference, and it was, oh, I don't know what throwing longer feels like or throwing shorter feels like, not like group B did. So we use this, this idea of variance or this art of variance whenever we train in hitting. Things are seemingly random when it comes to hitting, whether it's we don't know the pitch type, the location, or the speed beforehand. We might have a probability what percentage is going to be thrown. We might be working on pitch recognition, so we, uh, that kind of increases the probability of what pitch we're seeing, but we're never 100% sure what is coming at us and where it's coming and how, how fast it's coming. So we have to train that way. Practice like you're going to play, so you play like you practice. So what we do is we have what's called the varied reaction live toss drill. And you can see this other plate that's about maybe 10 feet behind this one. You can adjust this. You can, uh, this is all adjustable. You can go five feet behind. You can go 15 feet behind. But the idea is to have two separate distances from the L screen that's going to be stationary out front. So as you can see, the shorter distance, so this plate here is going to be shorter to the L screen, which is going to simulate a faster or slower pitcher. So it should be a faster pitcher. We scoot back here, it's going to be the opposite. It's going to be a longer distance, so it's going to simulate a slower pitcher. So what we do is we have our hitters, we'll take a five swing round at the shorter distance, so simulating a fast fastball pitcher, right? And this is both fast, uh, sa fast pitch softball and baseball. This works for both, okay? This isn't, this isn't for one or the other. So we have them take five swings at the close plate, then we'd evaluate. We'd go through our bad hitting outcomes checklist. And then we'd switch next round to the farther plate. Take five swings. We'd go through our bad hitting outcomes checklist at the end of five swings. At the end, not in the middle, but at the end. And then we just switch them back and forth just like that until you start, they start cleaning up, they start swinging at more strikes, they start getting better on time. And, and if we're at practice, then their mechanics are cleaning up. Then what we do to make this harder is we, instead of switching every five swings, we'll have them switch every two swings and do six swings total. So they might start here for two swings, and then after that they'll go there for two, then they'll, they'll come back here for two. The next round that they go back again after you go through your bad hitting outcomes checklist, then you start them back here for two, switch here for two, go back here for two. Bad hitting outcomes checklist. You getting the idea of this, the re repetition? So then to make it harder, once they start cleaning up, they're swinging at more strikes, they're being on time, their mechanics are cleaning up. And then we go, we switch them every two pitches. 
So what I do as an instructor is I'll throw it out of the zone so I know they're not going to swing at it, maybe twice, so that they never get to swing at a pitch here. They have to switch to this one. So now they haven't taken a swing at this one and now they have to not only gear their swing up but they also have to be on time. So we'll switch them every two pitches and we'll just go five total swings. So whenever they get the five swings done, then, then that round is over and we go over the bad hitting outcomes checklist. But this idea of variance is huge and the beauty of this drill is that you, you as a coach, instructor, parent don't have to coach at all. You don't have to tell them, well I want you to break your hands at this point when you're at this plate. I want you to break your hands when the pitcher's getting back here at this plate. Just let them do it. Just let them go. Let them figure it out. We, Our brain has, is hardwired to make adjustments and if you let the, allow them to make adjustments without you getting in and meddling after every swing, which I used to do, you become training wheels on a bike. You either have training wheels or you don't. You, you're either going to ride that bike like a normal person, like a normal adult, or you got the training wheels. You can't just have one training wheel on that bike and expect to be able to ride the bike when you take it off. You have to, you, you, yes or no question, can you ride a bike or can you not without training wheels? So by you being the coach and giving feedback all the time after every swing, again, I've done this before, you become training wheels. We have to take those training wheels off. So during this drill, quiet. You might say, okay or something, but don't give them any sense of great swing or sometimes I slip up and do that. But you want to you want to allow them to make the adjustments on their own without seeing your feedback until the end. Then the end we go through our bad hitting outcomes checklist. And if anything is in there that they don't, that maybe they didn't get right, uh, did you swing any strikes? And they're like, no, I swung at all strikes. And they were swinging the pitches up here, out here, and on the ground and the whole thing. You say, no, 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 those pitches were not strikes. We need to make sure we understand what the, what the strike zone is. So we use that as a teaching opportunity. But only at the end. We fill in the blanks at the end. We let allow the hitter, enable the hitter to answer us and come up with the answers. Make their brain work. Okay, So in this softball hitting drills fast pitch for timing video, we answer the reader question of why is timing not taught by a majority of instructors or they just don't know any better and they don't know how to teach timing. Because great mechanics are no good without being on time, obviously. So how do we teach timing? We went over the bad hitting outcomes checklist. Are we swinging at strikes? Yes or no. Are we on time? Yes or no. And then if we're at practice, okay, how are we doing with mechanics? If we're, if we're answering yes, yes and how are we doing with mechanics? We're still getting bad outcomes. We talked about the art of variance in the beanbag study and why variance is very important to teaching hitting. And we talked about and brought up the varied reaction live toss drill. One extra point on this drill is to make sure we're simulating a, a similar, very similar pitch plane that they're going to see in a game. Pitch plane is the imaginary line that goes from the pitcher's release point down into the catcher's glove. If we draw a straight line from that there, it's going to be in a downward plane more so in baseball than soft, softball or fast pitch, but we're still going to see the ball coming down in fast pitch. Okay, So we want to make sure that we're simulating that as a coach. So if you're a fast pitch softball coach, we want to make sure that we're throwing and we're releasing from a similar distance. Okay, So with baseball, it gets a little bit more dicey because we're getting shorter and we don't we want to make sure that we're not, as a coach, say if, if you're if you in the camera, you're right there and I'm right here throwing to you and you're a seven-year-old and I'm throwing as an adult standing up and I'm throwing down, okay, that seven-year-old is going to be like this, trying to swing up at that because the plane is too steep. So you have to sit on a bucket at that distance, I'd have to sit on a bucket at this distance and throw, so my release point's more here. It's more simulated of what they're going to see. Now some of you don't really throw overhand very well, maybe your arms hurt or you just don't have any accuracy, that's okay. What you can do, you can do underhand soft toss, but if you're doing that with baseball players, you're going to have to raise up. I saw a drill where they had a box and a chair on the box, there's a sturdy box, make sure you're not being, you know, common sense, it sometimes isn't so common, but make sure you got your common sense. You get a box that's sturdy that lifts you up maybe a couple feet from the, from the ground if you're throwing underhand uh, toss. At least if you raise yourself up and you're tossing from this here, now they're seeing a, simul a similar pitch plane angle, okay? So I hope we're, make sure that we're swinging smarter by moving better. And before I let you go, the Hitty Performance Lab wants to know, did you know that you may be losing out on eight miles per hour of average bat speed because of one commonly taught hitting technique? Have you ever heard the coaching terms, squish the bug, squish out the cigarette butt? Well, we created a free video revealing the results of a scientific study that will show you how we added an average of eight miles an hour to average bat speed by doing the exact opposite of squishing the bug. Click here now to get the video while it's still free.